Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live on May 30th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Later on in the show today, we're going to hear from two famous alumni of New College of Florida, X Gonzalez and Derek Black. They're going to talk about changes to their at their alma mater since Governor DeSantis appointed a conservative majority to the school's board of trustees. But first, we're going to bring on a St. Petersburg City Council member to talk about affordable housing and tenants' rights. And I'd like to hear from you. What's the housing situation like in your neighborhood? Are you a tenant? Are you a landlord? What do you think about Florida passing laws forbidding local governments from making local rules? And the best way to reach out is by text or email. You can email dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. I want to welcome now our guest, St. Petersburg City Council member Richie Floyd. Floyd is a former teacher and union activist. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Council member Floyd. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on the show. So before we talk about tenants' rights, let's just set the stage about housing and affordability in the region. How hard is it to find an affordable place to live? Uh, you know, from my perspective, it's it's gotten increasingly difficult, and honestly, I'd say incredibly difficult. Um, over the last few years, uh, housing prices have skyrocketed as they backed off in other parts of the country. They've continued here, um, and in much places in the South, um, it's really expensive. A lot of people uh, want to live where the sunshine and the weather is good year round. And uh, we're struggling with it here. Our, our current residents are are finding it increasingly difficult to remain housed. So the city is trying to do some things about housing affordability. What are some of the things that your St. Pete City Council has looked at over the last few years and maybe is still considering? Well, we've had uh, a plethora of things. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think there's always room to do more, and I think uh, we could be doing better as well. But, uh, you know, we've facilitated uh, housing deals to get uh, developers to build affordable housing. Um, we have uh, instituted some tenants' rights, uh, although, uh, like you mentioned, the state is pushing back on that. And uh, currently, my most recent proposal has been... Um, a program called Tenants' Right to Counsel, and it's basically a, a program where if you're facing eviction or behind on your rent, you get uh, legal aid uh, to try to help you sort out your situation. And so there's a lot of different things. Uh, there's other things as well around home ownership, um, helping city employees pay their rent. Um, the list really goes on. Well, let's talk right now about Tenants' Right to Counsel. Tell us more about what that would do and where that stands in the city. Okay, yeah. So um, the first thing to know about uh, evictions is they're a cumbersome process uh, that's not fun for the tenant for sure, and usually isn't great for the landlord either. So um, they cost a lot of money just to file. And uh, obviously, that's a problem for the landlord. And then it's a problem for the tenant that they get kicked out of their place. Um, and then uh, studies have shown anywhere from 15 to 45% of homelessness is a direct result of uh, evictions. And so if we can slow down the eviction process, which is heavily in landlord's favor in the state of Florida, um, we can help slow down homelessness and really save the money, save the city money over the long term. And so the goal here is to uh, provide every tenant who faces eviction uh, a, a lawyer or legal counsel to at least advise them as to how they should proceed, negotiate with the landlord, uh, to try to get them more time in their home and uh, make it to where evictions slow down in the city. And this is a thing that's happened all across the country. I think four states and maybe like 15 municipalities have enacted it, and they've seen great results. And uh, so that's that's what we're trying to do here. Um, most recently, we've gotten some funding for it to take place in South St. Petersburg uh, over the course of the next year. And we passed a resolution uh, just a couple of weeks ago to uh, show our support for the administration going out and procuring uh, a legal service to do the work across the entire city over the next year. I want to remind people that our guest is St. Petersburg City Council member Richie Floyd, and we're talking about housing affordability and tenants' rights. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. We're coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. 
And so this, the tenants' right to counsel you're saying has a, a little bit of um, uh, sway in South St. Petersburg, you mentioned, but what about the citywide? Is it still, will this be heard before the city council to, to go? Is there, are there other steps that could be happening? Yeah, so we did pass a resolution council in favor of uh, it going citywide, and the plan right now is for the staff and the mayor's office to go out and uh, put together a proposal, a uh, request for a proposal uh, to solicit uh, legal services to provide the work for us. Once they get those legal services to give us proposals, it'll come back to council. We'll review the proposals, we'll review the proposal that the mayor chooses or the city staff chooses, and then we will allocate the funds. And so we've still got to go through the procurement process and the allocation of funds and the okaying of the contract. Um, but uh, council has signaled support for us citywide. Let's talk now about some of the other tenants' rights, uh, things that have gone through city council recently. And so one of them is uh, preventing landlords from discriminating against future tenants who rely on government assistance that lasts less than a year. So what's the issue there? What's the problem with uh, tenants who have who get government assistance and them finding a place to, to rent? So uh, a pretty common thing, unfortunately, is uh, landlords just saying they won't accept tenants, or I'm sorry, tenants who have housing vouchers. Um, you can get housing vouchers from a number of places. You can basically, the city provides a sort of voucher for a lot of their workers. Um, you can get them from local nonprofits uh, and social services, and you can also get them from the federal government, like Section 8 housing vouchers. Uh, and this is guaranteed money uh, for a landlord. Your tenant's not going to uh, lose their job and not have money. They're going to always have this voucher as long as they qualify for it, um, which uh, once they get on it, it's a very stable thing. But unfortunately, landlords uh, in the past have been known to say, we just don't accept tenants with vouchers. Um, and, you know, I couldn't tell you their reasons, but uh, there's, uh, you know, there's some less than reasonable ones, I think, involved there oftentimes, and uh, some that are more reasonable, but we've tried to accommodate those in our uh, ordinance prohibiting the discrimination of people based off source of income. And so anyway, um, we put this into effect a while ago and updated it recently, and it's had a great effect. Um, I had personally have had friends who could not find housing uh, because they uh, couldn't find anyone to take their voucher. And uh, that's all changed in the last few years in the city uh, for the better, and it's been really good. There hasn't been any problems at all with it. But uh, Unfortunately, the state uh, may preempt that and all of our other tenant regulations soon. Um, so we're really hoping that we can um, overcome those hurdles and continue to institute this program. Uh, it's been a great success, and I hope it continues. And we'll talk more in a moment about the state preemption. But I just want to remind people that we're speaking with St. Petersburg City Council member Richie Floyd. We're talking about tenants' rights, housing affordability. You're listening to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canaan, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And the um, there's another part of the tenants' rights that were instituted was giving the government 10 days to complete inspections that are required for certain renters who receive public assistance. Why is that important? Yeah, so that's exactly what I was talking about when I said like some things are, uh, we tried to overcome some hurdles. Um, in order to house uh, Section 8 voucher holders, you have to have your property inspected by the local housing authority uh, to make sure it's fit for uh, habitation. Um, you know, I think that's a pretty reasonable thing, making sure your property is fit for habitation. habitation. But um the complaints from landlords was that uh, it took too long and their unit stayed vacant for too long. And so we uh, basically just said, look, there's 10 days. If they can't get it done in 10 days, then um, you can move on. But the housing authority worked with us to come up with that number to say, yes, they could get it done in 10 days. And they'll guarantee that anyone uh, who applies will get it done in 10 days. And so that way we can make sure that people have, that have vouchers can get housed quickly. Um, and, you know, the thing about the vouchers is that 
you wait for years on waiting lists to get them, um, going through difficult situations uh, during those years, and then you finally get them, and then landlords are saying that they won't take them, that's unreasonable. People were losing their vouchers before this. They were waiting, doing everything right to get on these lists uh, to get the vouchers. And uh, now that we've passed this ordinance, it's made it to where people don't just lose that. Uh, and I think that's really powerful. Other counties and cities have tenants' rights ordinances nearby, like Pinellas County has one. City of Tampa and Hillsborough County have various tenants' rights organ, uh, ordinances. So how does St. Petersburg's compare to, especially to Pinellas's, and where do things overlap and where can things be kind of made more smooth? Yeah, so uh, first I'll say St. Petersburg was one of the first cities to do this. Even before my time on council, I was really grateful to see uh, a lot of the ordinances enacted. It's not just uh, a, a fighting against income discrimination. It's giving people increased amount of time to know when their uh, rent is going to be raised and making sure people know their rights whenever they sign their lease. Um, generally, the tenants' rights ordinances across the state have a lot of overlap. There's only so much we can do locally uh, because of state law. And so we're all sort of piling onto that. Now, Pinellas County, I can speak most uh, consistently on because, uh, you know, it's the jurisdiction we're under. And they actually came and did theirs a few years after St. Petersburg did ours. And they had everything that St. Pete had in it uh, and more. Uh, so some of the changes we made recently were to bring ours in into line with the counties. Uh, we laid the groundwork for uh, the first municipality in Pinellas County to do it. And then Pinellas County government took it on and expanded it. And they expanded it by um, increased amount of time uh, for the inspections like we talked about. And we recently updated ours to uh, match theirs. Um, but we did opt out of theirs so that our code enforcement could enforce it uh, because we believe our code enforcement would be more responsive and quicker than the Pinellas County code enforcement. So far in this interview, we've talked a lot about state preemption. So there were bills coming out of Tallahassee during the session that preempted local control of a lot of different things, but it, including HB 1417 and HB 133, they would wipe out local renter protections that, that you've been talking about. And they would also allow landlords to charge non-refundable fees in, instead of uh, security deposits that are typically refundable. What are your thoughts about those two bills? So the one that would preempt all uh, tenant landlord um, regulation is really disturbing. Um, I've been spending most of this interview detailing how uh, effective the city has been and how smooth everything has gone um, with our things like our tenants bill of rights. Um, and how much more helpful they've been to parts of our population. Uh, and all of that would go away, really. Um, there's some things we could still do, like tenants' right to counsel, uh, we believe would survive uh, because it's not regulating anything. It's just providing attorneys. But, uh, you know, the income discrimination, the uh, amount of time before rent increases, the amount of time before your landlord can cancel your um, uh, can cancel your lease, all of these things would go away. Uh, across the entire state and would really cause difficulty for tenants um, in the cities that have enacted them. And so uh, I think it's waiting on the governor to sign it. I mean, you know, I'm not going to hold my breath, but I really do hope that he doesn't sign it. And uh, and then, you know, there's the other bill about the, um, the fees, charging fees uh, instead of uh, a deposit, you know, I think the thought behind that was, oh, it's a lot of money up front. And so you spread it out. You know, I just uh, I can't take anything the state says in good faith at this point, honestly. So uh, I, I have concerns. And I think, you know, that could play out really negatively for tenants. Um, just adding to where they can have fees charged to them constantly, it could just be another tax. Uh, uh, on poor people in this state, and so I'm um, concerned. Our guest is St. Petersburg City Council member Richie Floyd. We're talking about housing affordability and tenants' rights on Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan coming to you from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. 
We have a, a question from one of your constituents. Joe writes, I'm a resident of Floyd's district. Would like to know why the city is interested in enforcing existing ordinances that prohibit short-term rentals from occurring more than three times in any year period. He says there are multiple multi-unit Airbnbs on my street and dozens more in my neighborhood. Freeing up this housing stock for annual rentals for locals that want to live and work here seems to be the simplest and most effective way to get more housing on the rental market. So that's thanks for that question, Joe. What would you say, Councilmember Floyd? Yeah, Joe's totally right. I mean, we have an ordinance in place that prohibits um, short-term rentals. And uh, for the exact reason mentioned in the question, um, you know, short-term rentals are uh, taking housing stock off the market away from people who need to live and work here. And so uh, we do have an ordinance on the books uh, that I would say not the, not an issue, but, you know, the, the difficulty is enforcement of the ordinance. Um, it's, it's up to our codes department to enforce this ordinance. Uh, and the investigations can be quite cumbersome and take up a lot of time. I've been trying to work with the codes department to uh, bolster their resources, and that's the thing that I'll be talking about with them over the next year or so. But uh, what we need really is people like Joe to report these uh, short-term rentals to codes, uh, and when they report them, provide as much evidence as possible so that uh, the investigations, uh, the wheels are greased for the investigation. Uh, codes has to go in and act as if they're going to rent it and make sure it's not being rented for uh, more than it's allowed to be rented for because people can rent them for uh, longer periods of time or fewer times a year. Um, and so we just have to make sure uh, that it's if it's going on, people are telling us so that we can investigate it. I would really encourage anybody, if you're seeing this in your neighborhood, please uh, report it to codes. You can do it through uh, a number of ways call the city you see click fix um, and uh, any support we can get from the community will make it easier on us as well. So if there's residents out there who are interested in housing and they want to watch St. Petersburg City Council for what's coming up next, what should they be looking out for? When's the next time you, you'll be talking about this or voting on on something that has to do with housing rights? So I think the uh, the next thing will be our tenants right to council. I can't give you an exact date, but it should be in the coming months. Um, so you can pay attention to that. Uh, unfortunately, if the state does preempt it, we're going to have to roll back a lot of our ordinances that we have now. You probably don't want to watch that. I don't want to be there for that either. Um, but uh, and then there's always ongoing housing deals. Uh, I'm actually putting in a new business item uh, as we speak. Uh, in the next couple of weeks that you'll be able to see to talk about municipal bonding um, to try to do city owned mixed income housing. Because um, ultimately, I think, uh, you know, relying on the private sector and people who are trying to create a profit off of our housing uh, is not going to solve our solution. There is not going to solve our problem. They're out to make money. They're not out to house people. And so uh, I'm trying to get a conversation started about uh, building housing for human for human need, um, doing it mixed income, high quality, uh, so that we can get everyone in our city housed. We have a shortage uh, for everyone, and uh, that'll come up in the next couple of weeks. It'll just get sent to committee, uh, and so you'll be able to see those couple of things pretty soon. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Council Member Floyd. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. I'm glad you could join us. Richie Floyd is a St. Petersburg City Council member.